The Wind is My Mother, Bear Heart, Molly Larkin. Book three, Learning How to Live. Chapter 10, The Power of Love. During World War II, when housing was hard to get and many people had to live in crowded conditions, there was a family staying in a hotel in New York City while they were looking for a permanent place to live. One day, their little girl was riding down on the elevator with a man who knew her family, and he said to her, it's too bad you don't have a home. Without blinking an eye, the little girl said, oh, we have a home, we just don't have a house to put it in. A house can be a mansion, shack, tent, or even a dugout. A home is where love abides in the hearts of those who live there. What is love? What is the manifestation of love? Picture a mother sitting in a room, maybe sewing or reading or watching TV while a little child's playing in the floor with dolls and toys. All of a sudden, the child gets an inspiration, runs to her mother, jumps on her lap, puts her little arms around her. Mommy, I love you. That's an expression of love from a little child's heart. Can you buy that? Can you force it to happen? How much is that worth in terms of money? It's a little love expressed in the very best way the child knows how. Their own volition. I love you, Mommy. Love is synonymous with the word forgive. They go hand in hand. Many people quote a prayer from the scriptures, forgive us our debts. But it goes on to say, as we forgive our debtors. It's a two-way thing. There's a story in the Bible about the prodigal son. His father was a wealthy man, the ruler of a country. The son to, said to his father, everything that's going to come to me, I want it now, not after you have died. He was the kind who prayed for patience by saying, God, give me patience and give it to me now. So his father gave him his inheritance and his son went out in great style with many friends and then suddenly lost everything. He must have ended up in Atlantic City or Reno or gone into stocks, buy high, sell low. The money was gone, and so were his friends. What happened? He got hungry, and when he got hungry, he began to think of home. In my father's house, even the servants have much to eat and more. They can't finish the food. It's so plentiful there, yet here I am, the king's son, starving. He got a job feeding some hogs, or as it's written in the scripture, swine. They were considered the lowest form of animals in the biblical sense. And he had become a waiter to the hogs. Here's your food, sir. Have you ever seen a hog eat? He never looks up to see where it's coming from because they're enjoying it so much. He almost got down on his hands and knees and started eating with them. But then he thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just better go home. But if I go home, my inheritance is gone and I have nothing coming to me. Now, how do I get it back? I'll say this to my father. So he rehearsed it in his mind. Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. If you will take me back as one of your hired servants, maybe I can eat. He didn't intend to go that far, but that's what he meant. He wanted to have some food. He wanted to have some of the good things he'd been accustomed to. He got it all fixed up in his mind, not knowing that every day his father was looking down the road, hoping that he would see his son coming back. There was a connection between father and son that never diminished. On that particular day, as the father was watching the road, there came the son. He couldn't believe his eyes. Yes, he's coming. He didn't force his son to return. He was coming back on his own. The father didn't even wait until his son came to that great mansion. He ran out and embraced him. 
My son was dead, but he's alive again. My son has returned. The son started with his little speech. Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. But that's as far as he got because the father made it easy for him to say, I'm sorry. Too often when someone has wronged us, we don't make it easy for them to say, I'm sorry. Come crawling back to me and I'll think about it is often the response. But the father was so glad to have his son back, he embraced him and called him son. They wore sandals in those days, but I doubt the son had sandals by the time he got home. There were too many thorns and stones they had to walk across to get back. They cleaned him up and put new shoes on his feet, and he could walk around the kingdom once more. Then his father put a robe on him, purple for royalty. He must look like the king's son and carry himself like the king's son. Next, he received the ring with a signet that was like the credit card wherever he went in the kingdom. All he had to do was show that signet and he could get anything he wanted. Then the king said, now let us make merry and have a big feast. The story is a great lesson in forgiveness. And that forgiveness could never have come unless there was love. Why all this fighting? There are two words people use a lot. One is unity and the other is harmony. You can tie a cat's tail and a dog's tail together and drape them over a clothesline. You'll have unity, but you won't have harmony. Harmony is a tolerance, a forgiving, a blending. Subtle, soft, but very strong. In order to live in harmony, the common denominator that binds is loving one another in its truest form. Look at an anthill with many ants going back and forth. Some ants are carrying things down into the anthill, and after they've unloaded their burdens, they go back for more. There are two lines coming and going, a lot of traffic, and many ants. Have you ever seen them bump into one another? Have you ever seen an ant stop to fight another ant with others jumping in? Even though there's a lot of traffic involved, there's a sense of orderliness, a sense of purpose, a sense of doing something together. There's not just wandering around randomly. Just because they're ants, they don't sit around and expect things to come to them. They're working together for their survival. If our minds are supposed to be superior to the ants, then why all this fighting? We talk about war zones and send aid and money to other countries, but the greatest war is in the cities of our own country. We need to study the ant colony and get back to the simple order of life. How is it with us today in our society? Are we too prejudiced? Why is it that some belong to a particular religion or race? He can't help someone who doesn't belong to it. What kind of love do they have? It's very conditional love. Unless you do this, I will not help you. I was in the Rangeley Mountains of Maine soon after the area had a big forest fire. The fire was getting very close to a Baptist church, but a Catholic boy got out a hose and saved that church by watering it down. When an earthquake happens, People go beyond racial and belief lines in order to help others. When people help clean up debris after a flood or hurricane, they don't stop to say, what nationality are you? What faith are you? Everyone pitches in when tragedy strikes. Do we always have to wait for a crisis to be able to truly manifest our love for one another? People talk about unconditional love but they never talk about non-judgmental support, which goes hand in hand with unconditional love. Those two go together to express real love. I used to go to a church where the choir had to march on both sides to get into choir loft. Altos and basses came in one way, sopranos and tenors came in the other way, and they had to pass one another until they filled up the loft. There were two ladies in the choir who were not speaking to each other, even at church. So they passed by 
one would look one way and one would look the other and yet the first song was oh how we love Jesus if they can't love each other how can they say they love the one who created them if someone is unkind or throws verbal daggers at you that person has a problem why make it your problem too you might not love what a person is doing but you must love the person because if you're going to say you love a higher being you have to remember he created that person also if you can't forgive then that's a challenge for you to work out on until you can pray for that person and mean it there's a big load is going to be lifted from you until you do that you carry a nagging aching feeling all the time you can't even rest with it at night you lay and toss and turn and all kinds of dreams come up your inner consciousness is trying to get through to your brain but it can't get through because it's all clogged up with anger it's one thing to talk about love and forgiving but another to truly forgive break apart the word forgiving for giving giving what giving love this is why love and forgiveness are intertwined there was another lady who used to sing off key in that choir there was a big service coming up one where there was going to be a lot of guests and people wished that she'd get sick or go on vacation and miss it but she was always there never missed the service then one day she died. They did miss her then. Even with her off-key singing in her own way, she was expressing her love. They realized it then and they really missed her. They also found out that she used to get on her knees and pray for each member of the choir before entering the church auditorium. So it's not how beautiful or resonant your voice is. What matters? is in your heart the connection you have that's what counts many years ago there was a church in oklahoma city whose deacon wouldn't allow two of our indians with long hair to come in i happened to know the pastor of that church and i had a long session with him i said what kind of hair do did paul have what kind of short hair did peter have and what business is it of yours to not allow any person to come in here. I'm not speaking just because they happen to be Indians. Your church has a dress code. Where is it in the Bible that you must follow a dress code in order to worship God? We had a wonderful talk, and he had a few tears in his eyes when I left. Some people have a tendency to make more of the rules and rituals than what is in their hearts which is what really counts when we pray it's good to have a certain atmosphere whether it's in church praying with a rosary or in a sweat lodge but it isn't necessary we can pray at any time anywhere i knew many world war ii veterans who became preachers after the war they said we prayed under fire surrounded by machine guns mortars and cannons with devastation everywhere. Whether you grew up in church or not, sitting in a foxhole, not knowing whether or not you would live to see the next day, you truly connect with your Creator. I heard one veteran preaching a Mother's Day sermon and talking about how mothers are a great part of our lives, no matter how old we are. He said many of his buddies were shot in the foxhole and they lay dying. The last word they say was, Mama. The thing that's our strongest connection in life comes out in the end. So praying is not only following rituals and doing it just right. It's how we feel inside, how our heart connects, and how we live. That's called walking the spirit road. It's not just following a religion but following the universal being of all creation, of all wisdom. If we know him, then we do our best because we have a belief system based on love. And even if we make a mistake, we can say, I'm sorry. And he's ready to forgive. 
when we're afraid of doing something because of the consequences, we're turning religion into fear, not love. The words of Christ were, I came that you might have love and live in abundantly. To live life abundantly is to feel free. Love heals. The power of love, if that love is sincere and true, is the only force that can melt the human heart. Nuclear weapons can destroy people and have long-lasting effects, but love is what repairs and heals. No bomb can do that. It has to come from understanding and tolerance, and it has to come from forgiveness, being channeled into the lives of other people, making them feel their worth and stimulating their potential. If you have a lot of love, animals come up to you. Even flowers seem to follow you as you walk by, recognizing and responding to love. Love is expandable. It can encompass this whole universe. It can heal. Many years ago, there was a lady of my tribe who became serious, ill, and bedridden. In the way of clanship, she was my aunt, and many relatives and friends came around and prayed for her. An MD and a medicine man from our tribe treated her, but they both rather stumped and didn't quite know what was really wrong with her. She slept all the time and didn't seem to have any appetite. She was just wasting away. Some doctors thought it might be tuberculosis, but they couldn't get a correct diagnosis and say this is it. This lady had taken in a young boy who was her nephew, but she was raising him as her own son and he loved her very much. He was not a medicine man. He was not old enough. He was this ordinary, normal young boy. But one thing that he did have was love for this woman, whom he looked upon as his mother, and he decided to stay with her around the clock. All he had to offer her was running errands, getting her water, and changing the bedding. Other than that, he sat at her bedside. On the fourth day of his vigil, she awakened from the deep trance-like state that she had been in, and her strength started to return. One of our elders said, it is the power of this love that caused her healing to take place. Of course, we couldn't take this to a scientific laboratory and prove it. We just took it for granted because there's a great deal of healing love. And so we see what love can do. It's good to send out prayer-like energies when we see something out of balance in people's lives. If we see some drunk in an alley sleeping it off and people are passing by snickering and laughing, I can't help but say a prayer. Take care of him. Let no harm come to him. Bless him so that in time he can salvage the good that you have implanted in him. I don't know the person, his background, tribe, or name. That's not important. What's important is that he's a human being. I knew another Indian lady who was ill and was brought into an all-night prayer meeting inside a teepee on the Atobi reservation when there were many medicine people working on her all night long. One young man came in late. He was not a particularly religious person. He had gone to such meetings before, but not regularly. He was what we refer to as a roughneck. But this lady was related to him in some way, and knowing she was ill, he came to the meeting. Not being used to such ceremonies, he was very awkward at first. There was wood laid out by the fire in the middle of the teepee, and he accidentally kicked it, and sparks flew everywhere. When he sat down, he didn't sit cross-legged or on his knees to show respect like we do. He just sat with his legs straight out in front of him. As part of prayer circle in the teepee, the participants usually pray while smoking tobacco rolled up in corn shucks. That smoke carries our prayers up to the Creator. It took him a long time to roll his, and he spilled his tobacco and had to ask for more, causing quite a distraction. But after a while, he got his tobacco rolled up, and then he asked to pray out loud for this woman. She knows this kind of person I am, yet she never pointed a finger scorn at me. She always talks good to me. God, you have need for this kind of person to be in this world. 
If we had more people like her, maybe those of us who are looked down upon by others would not have reason to feel so bad about ourselves. She's the one who makes me feel good. I don't qualify like these other people who talk to you, but I came out here because I love her, and I ask that you look down upon her. You don't have to bless me, but I ask, if it's all possible, that you bless her. Take away her illness, whatever it might be. You're the one who can do it. That's all I have to say. The woman had been lying down, but soon after that, a prayer. After that prayer, she sat up and wanted to speak. I appreciate all the efforts everyone has put forth on my behalf. I feel well now. I have no pain, none whatsoever. And what got me well is how my son here prayed for me. What that prayer meant to me most was the fact that there was sincerity and love there. It was like taking good medicine, and I'm very grateful. Love heals. Love is what makes things a little better than before. Why do my people feel good about all mankind? Because love is universal. When I use the words my people, I'm identifying myself with all Native Americans, and especially my tribe. We accept all kinds of races of people, and we love them. Our history is not a beautiful example of mankind's tolerance and understanding toward fellow human beings. My tribe suffered many injustices, being forced to leave the places we call home, and dear, many hardships. Yet in spite of all this, we still hold to the belief that the Great Spirit is a God of universal love. And once we appropriate that love in our own hearts and minds, and we immediately let it flow through our lives and into the lives of others. We can feel love in our hearts, even for the white race, because not all white people were responsible for the injustices against our people. There were some who spoke in our favor, just as there are many who support us today. When our people were about to be removed from Georgia and Alabama, Davy Crockett, a well-known figure in history, walked to the home of Andrew Jackson, east of Nashville, Tennessee, and spoke in favor of our tribe staying in our homeland. Of course, we were moved from that area anyway, but his intercession is one example of the white people who were for us. We have come to find out that there is always good and bad in every culture. And when we bring this universal love into our own lives, we feel better for it. My great-great-grandmother is buried at Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. She was part of that forced removal known as the Trail of Tears. I don't know which of the graves is hers. There are many crosses there with no names. There is so much anger that I could have in my heart but I don't. Somewhere along the way, I found out about this great love from a great creator, and with that love comes forgiveness. Why not live a life where you allow that great love to come in and work through you? We study human beings, different societies, and how one culture is different from another culture, but now is not the time to look at differences but to see how we are all alike. Love is the common denominator that goes through all cultures and binds us together. Without it, we're lost. The people of God. I don't always feel comfortable in talking about Indians. Even the word Indian itself is very misunderstood. When Columbus found the natives here, they were gentle people who accepted him. So Columbus wrote in his journal, these are people of God. In his language, he wrote Indios. Later, the S was dropped and the Indio eventually became Indian, which originated as people of God. So we became Indians because of that. But they often teach in school that when Columbus discovered the new world, he mistakenly thought he had landed in India and even though he hadn't arrived in India, 
there is a place called the Indus Valley in India, and the people there have almost the same language as the Uchicha here in North America. Many of the words and names for things are the same. Even the skin color and texture of a Uchi's hair is like the Indians of India, so there's a connection. I speak 12 Native American languages, yet Cherokee is unlike any Native American language I've ever heard. It sounds more like the Chinese Mandarin dialect, so it makes me wonder if there is some connection between them. Several years ago, I was invited to a conference in Council Grove, Kansas, sponsored by the Menninger Foundation. There are many people there from all over the world, and during the conference, a woman came up to me and said, I'm having a problem. I'm a registered nurse, the profession that I've been trained in and being practiced for several years, but I want to go into another field, and I don't know what to do. I said, that's your problem. What? You think you're throwing your practice and your training out the window, but you're not necessarily going into another field. You're extending the training and practice into a broader field of service. I built a fire and picked up a coal, put it in my mouth, and I blew on the hands and dedicated them. Now it's up to the higher being to point the way for you. Two years later, she created a form of therapeutic touch which is practiced all over the United States today. Her name is Dolores Krieger, and she has won national words for her work. While I was working with Dolores Tolka Tarthing Rinpoche, a Tibetan, was watching me and out of the clear blue sky asked, Do you use peyote? He caught me by surprise. I didn't know he knew anything about peyote. I said, yes, I do. He said, I wondered, because in northern Tibet, we have some people who use peyote, and they use those coals just like you do. I had no idea. It was quite interesting. The interconnectedness of the people of the world goes way back. Columbus was not the first to come to America. We used to think the Vikings were, but scientists have found some Hebrew writings in North America, and they think perhaps the Hebrews were here before the Vikings. It's been said that Native Americans may have been part of the ten lost tribes of Israel. There is evidence of Jews who are Chinese and some in South Africa who are black. Then there are Indian Jews in Mexico, and today's anthropologists and archaeologists cannot tell you where they came from. That leads me to believe that maybe we are part of the Ten Lost Tribes because of the similarities between the practices of the Hebrews and the American Indians. We both fast at our New, new Year time. When the Hebrews roamed around the desert, they traveled in a caravan with the women, old men and children in the middle, and the warriors outside for protection. That's how our people moved from place to place. They also had skin tents, kind of like our teepees of old. It's possible that the Hebrews were here in North America first and then traveled to Israel, or that we came from Israel to North America. The number four is very significant to Native people. It is a number of completeness. The white, black, yellow, and red races represent all humanity. At one time, there might even have been a common race of people who divided and became different colors with different backgrounds. Maybe this was a preparation for each of those races to learn all they could among their own people. And then in time, we will combine the red, black, yellow, and white into one big culture. And if the spirit is one, as may, we may not change colors, but instead change our attitudes into the spirit of oneness with all living things on this planet. Not only the two legs, but the four-legged, the winged, those that are in water, and those that crawl. It is time to stress the things we have in common with one another to show how much alike we are.
we might be surprised to find that we are truly all brothers and sisters in this universe. And most important, that we have to maintain that relationship in order to survive. <laughs>